I'm Tisha Bader, and in the news, we continue to deal with and look at the recent overruling by the U.S. Supreme Court of Roe v. Wade, ending a woman's constitutional right to an abortion. The 1973 ruling has been upheld for almost 50 years until now. We spoke in our last In the News on the issue with Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz from a Jewish law perspective. Well, today we want to look at the issue from a historical perspective of women's rights and feminism and how the struggle has looked over the last few decades and what the reaction to the reversal is. And we are fortunate to have with us an icon in the feminist movement, a woman who has been on the front lines of women's issues for decades a leader in many social justice causes, a prolific writer, and a founding editor of Ms. Magazine, and a co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus, Letty Cotton Pogrebin. Letty, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us here on JBS. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you. So when I was preparing this interview, I actually looked at an interview you did with JBS President Mark Gala back in 2015, and the two of you were discussing what it was like in the 60s and 70s and the accomplishments and how far women have come since then. And I was thinking, and now we're here. Yeah. And now I'm sitting with you here in 2022 to talk about this monumental reversal. What does that feel like for you? It, feel like it's one of, it feels like one of those movie um, uh, affectations that both which shows a clock going backwards and as if I've witnessed it as, as if my entire life uh, is bookending this struggle which I lived through as a young person to gain our rights to our own body to gain bodily integrity to have that legal protection constitutionally and then watching it all rewind we saw it happen immediately the right-wing backlash was perceptible instantly in terms of uh, erosions of that right, whether it be parental consent or waiting periods or forcing you to watch a sonogram or any number of things that suggested that women weren't fully grown adults able to make life decisions of that importance on their own or with their doctor or with their clergy person or with their partner and so on. And now where we are is I, I feel worse off quite frankly, because once you've achieved something and then it gets taken away, you know what it feels like to have freedom and the notion that you don't have it anymore and that this is sort of progress. This is a linear uh, kind of historical inevitability is just shocking to us, painful. I'm in mourning, quite frankly. And you talk about pushback and backlash. You, you spoke to Mark in that same interview about facing that when you were when it was the 60s and 70s. And you thought, OK, we'll just show people that this is how it should be. And then it will be that way. And there was all this backlash and pushback. Is it that same pushback, that same backlash that brought us to this point? Or how how do you look at that? I think that we underestimated how organized uh, the right wing uh, extremists would be. We we knew that they were working uh, at the legis at the local legislature uh, um, level, and yet we we didn't create uh, our own agenda. We were not we didn't have the fire in the belly. Even as recently as the 2020 election, I kept saying to people, vote on one on one issue, the Supreme Court. And it just seemed unthinkable that we could ever lose a constitutional right that we had for 50 years. So people voted on poverty issues and on COVID and all kinds of things without any recognition that this was going to impact their own lives. So I think the the extent of it, the extremism of it, uh, the uh, the fact that it comes at us from all directions, that is right-wing media, and it comes at us legally with the Federalist Society. They've been building for, you know, judges to take over locally and on the circuits, courts, and so on. And frankly, they, they were, they outsmarted us. Uh, they understood the importance of all of this dogged 
bit by bit incremental advance of their side of the issue. And we didn't understand that it could possibly be taken away. Letty, are you in contact with, you, you've stood alongside incredible women like yourself, um, for example, Gloria Steinem, is that someone you're still in touch with and have you talked about this since the reversal happened or since the leak happened that this was going to be happening? Yeah, since the leak happened in May, I think we've all been galvanized. Um, Gloria is a friend of more than 50 years still uh, and will always be. Um, and we work together on, on several different projects. Um, we're on the um, Free to Be Foundation. Which Can came- I just say <laughs> one of my favorite movies, period? The album, yeah. everything. I'm a huge fan. Okay, now you can keep talking. Hey. I had to say that. Just for those who who, who either missed it on the first time around or are too young to remember, "Free to Be You and Me" was Marlo Thomas's project. It was a, it is to this day a very a popular family entertainment, and we had songs like "It's All Right to Cry," which was sung by Rosie Greer, who was an enormous, powerful football player who sang that it was all right for boys to cry and big boys cry too, he said. And we showed lots and lots of pictures of, you know, athletes and diplomats and presidential candidates crying when it's appropriate. When you're emotionally moved, you cry. And it's not a masculine feminine thing. It was uh, parents or people, um, which Marlo Thomas did with Harry Belafonte. uh, about the fact that mommies have jobs and daddies have jobs and they're together if if you have a if you're lucky enough to have a have a, a, a an intact parent partner relationship then they raise their children together um those those pieces from free to be you and me have you know raised three generations worth of non-sexist multicultural non-racist thinking um grown-ups so you mentioned Gloria and that you are you are in touch with her, which is oh, which yeah. is lovely. Have you spoken? What are the kinds of conversations you're having? Just if you can give us a little bit well, of an I, idea I, about I, this reversal. I've had so many of those conversations, and basically, people, whether friends or or acquaintances or people who just write me out of the blue, they want to know what what to do, what to do. Uh, I publish a newsletter. I post a newsletter periodically, and I listed those things and they begin with uh, working at the state level, trying to obviously trying to change uh, the political uh, balance in state legislatures, in local legislatures, in library boards, where we now see banned books all over the place and and school boards. That's one thing. But when it comes specifically to reproductive freedom, I think what we want to do now is we want to fund people who cannot afford Uh, to have an abortion because they have to travel 300 miles. They have to leave their job. They need to set up childcare. They need hotels. They need food um, and they need travel expenses. So there are several places that you can donate right now and know that it's a hands-on helping hand. And what do you make of the response from the Jewish community or do you have feelings about that? How, what you've seen, what you've heard from people in the Jewish world about the reversal? Well, uh, I'm impressed with the Jewish community as a whole. In the Orthodox community, uh, I've seen many mailings that establish that Jewish law, halakha, requires that the mother's life take precedence, which means that a woman must be able to have an abortion if her life is threatened by delivery or by carrying a child. And that includes her psychological health as well, as well as her physical health. So halacha, the rabbis, the sages, the chachamim, they couldn't be clearer about this. Women take precedence and nobody should come along. And this, in fact, is a question now of religious rights. There's a case in Florida that's already been filed where um, religious freedom is the claim and it's a Jewish woman. Uh, her lawyer has made exactly that claim. The state can't intercede and interfere with her uh, religious practice insofar as uh, the freedom to determine uh, whether her life is is at risk. And of course, with most things in Judaism, we it's, you know, there are various interpretations. And I, I do think 
you know, we're seeing a lot of Jewish organizations backing up what you just said. And then there are some in the ultra Orthodox community who welcomed the reversal, but also say that they don't want to impose their views on all of society, but they also welcome the reversal. So of course there are always, you know, um, people across the spectrum who have, have different viewpoints, but. True. And I'm wondering also. True. I guess I, I'm not, I'm not seeing, I mean, I'm seeing it, but I'm not, I'm not reading into it. I, I anticipate that there's a kind of a fundamentalist strain within Judaism as there is in every faith. Uh, but what, what comforts me and reassures me um, are these other uh, exclamations of support and, and enthusiastic um, affirmations of women's rights. Well, something interesting that Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz said, who is um, president of Maharat and the first I know. Orthodox. I know. Mm-hmm. Yes. So she said that, as you mentioned, this is going to create issues for um, those Orthodox women who consult with their rabbi, with their rebbe, as you just mentioned, and the rabbi rules that an abortion is the option, the, the choice that she should make and the state that she's living in, Precisely. there's a ban. So these, that's like, as you mentioned, a whole nother side of this. And, that, and one case in Florida is, is already in, uh, in the courts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Letty, when you look at the women, the young women in particular who are protesting now, who are out there rallying, making their voices known. Do you see, or what are the similarities and differences you see from those women now and the women in the 60s and 70s that you were marching alongside and fighting? What are your impressions when you look at them? Does it remind you of those days or is there a difference in this generation now? Uh, there's a continuum. It reminds me of those days. We didn't dress like that. <laughs> we we always felt we had to sort of look conservative and, you know, we were all carefully quaffed. And I just love it. I love that you see people looking like real people marching and making demands without feeling they have to be little ladies and well-behaved in order to do it. Um, you know, in the 50s, we did. Even the women who, who marched against the bomb you know, wore their fur coats to, so that they would appear to be, you know, the best of society. It, it's bizarre. But now you are who you are and you make your demands based on, on the obvious, the obvious need for freedom and rights. What astonishes me is, is seeing women my age. Uh, I'm 83 years old. Uh, I have marched more times than I can count. I have on my uh, opening Facebook page is a picture of me marching in a reproductive rights march with Jerry Nadler, uh, our congressperson from the Upper West Side, who I hope wins. Um, and I, I've done it. I'm not going to do it anymore because I really feel this is their time. Mm-hmm. But when I look at the pictures of marches, I see women my age carrying placards and saying, I never thought I'd have to do this again. (laughs) Or menopausal women for reproductive rights. Uh, Wonderful posters that indicate that there are women my age who haven't stopped. I'll go out if, you know, it comes to that. But right now I feel I have many more um, effective ways. And, you know, carrying a a placard for the umpteenth time isn't necessarily the best use of my time. But I am trying to organize, trying to organize and and trying to lead people to uh, places where where they can feel uh, effective in their activism. Well, speaking of one of the ways that you are spending your time, I know you have a new book coming out in September, which directly deals with this issue. It's it's very personal account of your own experience as a young woman, as a college student with abortion. Um, what, because obviously I'm guessing you started writing this a while back. Was there yeah. something that sort of propelled you to write about this in this way for this book well, at this time? The book is, is called Shanda, a memoir of shame and secrecy. And my abortions are one chapter. But um, uh, Hadassah Magazine currently is running that one chapter from my book in advance of its publication. But the book is looking at all the Shandas, or maybe it's Shandot, <laughs> plural. Shandai. Yeah, Shandai. Shandai. 
that I grew up with in, in uh, my Jewish upbringing, um, when so many so many issues threatened to unmask us as immigrants or unmask us as poor or unmask us as having an accent or being an old world person or eating odd foods. And the, uh, growing up in the 40s and 50s, I was alert to that because an immigrant family wants to be, they, we wanted to be real Americans. So I have chapters on a whole bunch of different things. I hope I'll have a chance to talk to you and the rabbi about in, in the fall. But that chapter was the hardest to write because the shame of having uh, an, uh, an unwanted pregnancy in 1958, I was a senior at Brandeis. I was uh, 19 years old and I would have, my entire life would have been derailed. I would never have had the family I have, the marriage I have, I have three wanted children. They have six altogether wanted. What are my grandchildren? Our lives would have been not, not been anything like that um, because I would have had to quit school. I would not have been able to get the work that I got and uh, create the life for myself. And the most uh, telling moment was when I told my husband when he when we were uh, we decided to get married, and I felt I had to be honest with him. I couldn't start a marriage. This was 1963. Five years later, uh, yeah, five years later, and I said, "I need you to know this about me in case it changes how you think of me or whether you want to marry me." Um, and I told him, and he said. It has nothing to do with us, he said. You know, he said he loved me and on onward and upward. <laughs> and that, and we've been married for uh, 58 years. Mazal Tov. Thank you. Um, it was a life that could not have happened. And so many women have unlived lives because of compulsory pregnancy. And because the so-called pro-life people are really not pro-child. An unwanted child abuse, neglect, poor health, and has a fairly uh, 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 unpleasant likelihood of uh, underperforming. And uh, this is now what I would consider pro-child. So uh, I'm perfectly comfortable espousing the issue. I have never had any regrets uh, because I know that uh, the children I have wouldn't exist had I been forced to have a child that I was totally unprepared for uh, to take care of, to support. I was self-supporting from the age of 16 on. I could never have done it. So it's a choice I made and have never regret, re regretted. And you talk about the shame. And that's something that Sarah Hurwitz also was discussing with me, that that's when she's counseling people who are in this extremely difficult situation. And, you know, there have been some part of a statement from one of the ultra Orthodox groups said something like they cannot support abortion on demand uh -huh. as if, as if, you know, to say, you just get up in the morning and say, you know what, I think I'm going to choose to do this. But she was stressing the fact that this is a painstaking, incredibly difficult dilemma that many times there's no alternative that this has to be the option. But regardless, she talks about this shame and how it is such a, a stigma, even, you know, today, uh, certainly I can imagine the 50s, 60s and 70s when this was just not discussed. You didn't talk and about it. Yeah, and illegal. The combination uh, uh, of shame and the difficulty that you describe in reasoning through each, each woman, reasoning through her her needs, her capacity, her ability, her state of mind, her state of health, her, her economic and financial wherewithal, getting through all of that. And let me say, these are married women in many cases. These are women who already have children in many cases. It's not as if they don't have a situation in which it, there would be no shame if they had a child. But there are all these other considerations and they're the considerations born of love 
and concern and care and responsibility. So to add shame to the top of it, which will be the case now that we're back where we started, where it's going to be illegal, where you're going to have a neighbor next door report on you in Texas, if she happens to overhear that you're planning to leave the state to go to a state where abortion is legal, and she reports you, and you what, get arrested, followed, brought back in, in, in manacles? Can you start imagining a world like this? It's like the, old, the Handmaid's Tale. It's unthinkable to me. And yet that's where we are in something like 20 something states where the trigger law, laws have already um, gone into effect and anti-abortion legislation is now on the books. So uh, you add shame and you add illegality and you add that, all of that to the uh, incredibly complicated considerations that go into whether am I ready to raise, bear and raise a child? And is my body in shape to do it? I had extremely complicated pregnancies and delivery because my first child was, was, a, was children. I had twins. And I, you know, I was a very, very thin person with 53 pounds worth of twins on my body. And it threw out my back. And I, I mean, I, I can't even go into the, the um, after effects that, you know, 50 odd years later, I still have when it comes to my body's um, alignment. Um, but who thinks about that? The, these men who are so eager for us to simply breed. But first, you know, you have to go through a lot to bear a child uh, and then to deliver a child and then to raise a child. And I wish that the right wing took that as seriously as they take this embryo. And I think, you know, it, it one of the uh, lines that you mentioned um, in the chapter that Hadassah, in the section that Hadassah released, I just want to read part of that quote. You think... Uh, the doctor who performed your abortion and saying that he was non-judgmental and it was his commitment to women's autonomy, not to the state, not to the state or someone else's religious beliefs that allowed you to move on with your life. And it's having the autonomy, having that option to choose, whether you do choose or not choose, having that freedom and ability Absolutely. to make that choice, that autonomy. And may I just underscore that I respect every woman's decision, including the decision of Amy Comey Barrett to have seven children, even though I can't imagine how you can devote enough attention to seven children. That's my problem. I would have trouble. I'm very intense about my parenting feelings, and it would be hard for me to um, imagine raising seven children, young children. But I so respect somebody who feels capable of doing that or someone who is uh, conscience bound to say, I believe abortion is murder. If you do, don't have one. Don't let anyone force you to have one. And, and that means if you're, if you're black, brown, any, any ethnic group, don't let anyone force you to have a, an abortion against your will. We know that's been done in the past for various reasons to people of color, powerless people and so on when it's un inconvenient for those in power to have women have children, they don't have children. And when it's not convenient for women to compete with men out in the world, abortion is outlawed. It comes down to choice. And Letty, thank you so much for sharing your perspective, which is so incredible. Your, your years of devotion to women's rights and social justice causes is, is an inspiration. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again and to continuing this conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Letty Cotton Pogrebin is a feminist icon. She is a prolific writer, an activist, a co-founder of Ms. Magazine. And we thank her so much for joining us here on JBS. And thank you as always to our director, Sloan Copeland, managing director, Dara Golub, our transmissions manager, John McDevitt, technical manager, Michael Paley, and our producer, Carol Lilienthal. And thank you for watching In the News.